And if you have your Bibles with you tonight, let's turn. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. Last week we kind of went through the, the most, uh, kind of a part of the, couple of the most powerful chapters in all of the book of Jeremiah. Of course, he represents a weeping uh, over the destruction of, of a nation. As I was going through this study, it's, um, you know, we're going through chapter after chapter after chapter that talk about Israel's unfaithfulness and how God has been so long-suffering with them, but He's going to judge them, and the judgment's going to be great. I think for us as Gentiles, and for, uh, for those I know who, who don't even understand the Old Testament, <clears throat> there's a reason. There's a reason why, <laughs> of all the books, 39 books in the Old Testament, that from chapter... 11 of Genesis, all the way through, the focus is on one nation, Israel. You say, why would God spend so much time with that? You know, this is His holy, eternal Word. <clears throat> and as we go through some of these longer books, it's like He just, it, it's, just kind of keeps going over and over this and this, this um, an agonizing over taking these people out of the land that He promised them. But tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about God's covenant in these chapters. And I just want to remind you that there's a reason for everything that God does. Because this nation is going to be a picture to us, not only of our relationship with God, but with God's covenant with man. He loves mankind, and He wants to dwell with all of us, doesn't He? And he's given us that promise. And when we think out for his eternal plans, Israel, as we'll see, plays into that. They're a picture, they're a model of that dwelling with the Lord, even in the millennium for a thousand years. And they'll be a blessing to all the nations. So with good purpose, he lays this foundation. And for us, it really ties in when we come into the New Testament. And God makes a covenant with all the world, doesn't he? Uh, for God so loved the world. And uh, that he's calling us into that same fellowship and relationship. So let's remember that as we head through verse 1. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. Which just basically means it's Zedekiah's tenth year of being king, and it's Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, it's his 18th year of being in power. Now at that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and now, um, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard, which was in the house of uh, the king of Judah, because Zedekiah, the king of Judah, had shut him up saying, Why do you prophesy, saying, Thus says the Lord? Behold, I'm about to give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and, and he will take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, will not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but he will surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will speak with him face to face. He's going to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the king of Babylon not too far from, from this time. And he's going to see him eye to eye. And he will take Zedekiah to Babylon. And he will be there until I visit him. <clears throat> that is, the Lord visits him. Declares the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, if you fight against the Chaldeans, you will not s succeed. So, this is another prophecy that's uh, come along um, here on a list of prophecies. And they're not all in chronological order. As we'll see, we're actually going to go backward in time through these uh, next few chapters, um, kind of getting farther and farther backwards, but God has a purpose for the order that he put it in and had Jeremiah put it in because he's going to speak about a theme and that theme is covenant, right? A covenant that they had broken their covenant 
uh, with the Lord. So the Lord had said, listen, if you stay in this city, you will die. You need to leave this city. And as we've said, the prophets were still there around Zedekiah, and they were telling him, no, God's going to deliver the city, and uh, we're going to end up in peace. And so apparently Zedekiah believes it, and some of these other uh, leadership and people there of Jerusalem, people living in the area have kind of left their little uh, small cities, and they've gone into Jerusalem because it's fortified. And uh, the rest, of, most of all of Judah, has already fallen under the Babylonian uh, army. And they're starting to besiege, as it said, build siege ramps up onto the walls, and they're just going to take the city. So the clock is ticking. It's not very far away. But apparently, uh, Zedekiah still has this false hope by false prophets that... Um, uh, he's going to get out of this. And so he doesn't like Jeremiah saying he's not going to get out of it. And uh, he doesn't want to hear that bad news. So he's locked him up basically in the king's palace. And uh, so he doesn't have a chance to get out of there. And uh, God's actually allowed you know, him to be there in captivity all the way up to this time that the uh, city is taken. So... Um, so even up to the end, when all the signs and the truth of God and all of that spoken, the prophets, again, are speaking falsely, and, and Zedekiah believes the lies. And, and that's kind of the way it goes um, when God's judgment comes in any of the ages here, when he promises judgment Satan is a good deceiver, isn't he? And he says, well, I, that, that's not really going to happen. I'm not really going to be judged. I mean, even the flood, all the way up to the very end, they're like, you know, they're marrying, giving a marriage, and all of that. And Jesus said, so, so it will be um, at the coming of the tribulation. Um, we would probably say at the time of the rapture or after the rapture because the Lord's going to take us out for a reason because... The wrath of God is going to be poured out. But people are still going to be thinking, this is all good. And uh, as we'll see, you know, even in the, in the tribulation, they're, they're still going to think it's uh, good. But that's the way the church is dealing with today. And this is my take on it. Uh, the broad spectrum of the church, again, a lot of it is probably ne not necessarily genuine believers, but they're religious and they claim Christ, and Christianity has been spread thin. I don't know if you noticed that, uh, just the term of what it actually means. But um, there's, there's um, teachers, I'm not saying they're prophets, but they're teachers that are teaching the Bible, and they are saying that we're heading toward peace. I don't know if you're you're with me on this, or if you understand this, but there are a lot of churches that believe that the history of the world is going to keep going, and the church is going to get better and better and better and stronger and stronger until the church makes the world Christian, okay? And that's, that's a post-millennial view, and it's kind of been become more popular uh, in these days. I don't know why. It doesn't seem like there's any signs there. There's definitely not any biblical signs because it all is very clear, it seems to be pointing out. But here this idea is you're telling the church, no, it's going to get better and better. And um, there's another part of that same teaching regarding the coming of the Lord, the return of the Lord, and, and this millennium that we're talking about it gets worse before the Lord returns. Um, and... And they're saying kind of a similar thing, but basically they're saying that, you know, things are just going to kind of keep going along like they are. And uh, they might get a little better, they might not get, you know, but they're not going to get much worse. And then all of a sudden the Lord is just going to show up and that's going to be the end. And that's kind of the way they paint history. You say, wow, what are, what are, what are, what are those groups? Well, that's an all-millennial group, which means... There isn't going to be a millennial reign of Christ. He's not going to come back to the earth and reign on the earth. So 
all these passages that we're dealing with um, are troublesome to them because this can't be literal that the Lord's going to judge the nations and He's going to restore Israel and all of that. And so uh, this group, let me tell you what they don't believe, okay? They don't believe in the rapture, not in the way we think of it. They just think of the rapture as being the very end of time and all the Christians go up and then uh, um, all the uh, unbelievers go down and there's a final judgment and that's it. No tribulation coming. No revived Roman Empire as Daniel speaks about and you know we see uh, the kings all gathering together and the Psalms speak about it and you know all the major uh, prophets and minor prophets speak about it as well but they say no there won't be um, a tribulation uh, coming. No um, gathering of this world empire again, as the, Daniel speaks about all the successive world ruling powers, and he speaks about finally the Lord returns and demolishes the last one. None of that's going to happen. No Antichrist is going to be coming to this earth. No Israel. Uh, no bodily return of Jesus to the earth. No earthly reign of Jesus. So no matter what, you know, either one of those positions, they don't believe that Jesus is going to be reigning. They believe that we are Christ, we are Jesus to the world, and that is the reign of Christ, even in this kind of millennium that they would say is there. No, uh, of course, literal earthly millennial kingdom at all. So both of those views that I just spoke uh, to you about are spoken and are taught, it's well over 80% of the quote-unquote church. So that would include all of the Catholic church, which is a, you know, a billion people on the earth, the Lutheran church, the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, the Anglican church, the Greek Orthodox church, uh, the Reformed church, um, um, not, not all Calvinists, but Reformed Church, Seventh-day Adventists. I mean, you can just keep going on and on. They, they all teach that. Isn't that interesting because we're speaking about just proclaiming the Word and, and what's coming, and, and, uh, but um, most all of it revolves around this, this little nation, Israel. Um, they've cut them out. I mean, again, 39 books, and God speaks about His covenant with His people having to do with these end times and restoring them and all of that, and all of that's gone, and the church has replaced Israel. It's called replacement theology, right? So, interesting, but I thought about that as I was thinking about this. Even up to the very end, they're saying, oh, no, it's, don't worry, you know, it's, things are going to keep going on, and we don't know when it's going to come, but there's, what is that lacking what, what, how does that affect the church? And I believe that there's a reason why we're supposed to have this expectation of these things that are coming, or a knowledge of what's coming, because it produces an urgency inside of the church. We don't know if the Lord's coming today or tomorrow, but the message of the church is a warning. Judgment is coming, and of course, judgment's coming for all of us at the end of our lifetime, but... It is true to say, listen, God will judge this earth. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And so uh, that should be a part of it. It's called the blessed hope, right, for the church. Our blessed hope isn't uh, for the church to be on this earth for another 20,000 years. Our blessed hope is the coming of the Lord. And of course, the coming of the Lord is for us to go out with it, but, the, but also the acknowledgement and then we'll return uh, with the Lord uh, to this earth, and He'll rule and He'll reign. So, um, as we think about this whole book, this whole Old Testament, and all the uh, prophecies that God gives, He keeps promising Israel, I'll be faithful to my covenants with you. They will not fail. As we said last week, when you don't see the sun anymore and you don't see the moon anymore, or if there's somebody who can pull down all of the stars of the sky, then you can start thinking that I might not be faithful to what I've said. <laughs> so those are all physical signs, aren't they? And I believe uh, the Lord here. So this is Zedekiah. He's in a, a bad place, obviously, and um, not, um, 
delusional, I guess you would say. Verse 6, and Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, behold, Hanamel, which we don't know at this point, the son of Shalom, your uncle, is coming to you, that is coming to you in your, to your prison cell, saying, buy yourself my field, which is at Anathoth, and that is, of course, in the land of Benjamin. So it was outside of the city, in, you know, the, to the north, in the land of Benjamin. He said, he's going to come to you and he's going to ask you to buy the field uh, at Anathoth, for you have the right of redemption to buy it. He was the nearest kinsman who could redeem this plot of land. Well, what good is that going to do? We're getting ready to be taken out of here, and all of it's going to go to the Babylon, uh, Babylonians. But he says, then, then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the guard, according to the word of the Lord, and he said to me, buy my field, please. That is at Anathoth, which is in the land of Benjamin, for uh, you have the right of possession, and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. I mean, it's like, you know, saying, hey, the city's going to burn down. Would you like to buy my house? I'll, get, I'll give you a good deal, right? But here's what he said. He says, then I knew this was the word of the Lord. So I bought the field, which was at Anathoth, from um, uh, Hanamel, my uncle's son, and I weighed out the silver for him, 17 shekels of silver. Apparently, they must not have taken uh, Jeremiah's money, right? It says, I signed and I sealed the deed, and I, I called in witnesses and I weighed out the silver on the scales. So he made this very official. All the paperwork was done. All of it was written down on a parchment, and it was all sealed, and all of this has been done, and the land in question, and all of it, and it was wrapped up, and again, they put that seal on it. And he says, and I took the deeds of the per, uh, purchase, both the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, and uh, the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Nerai, uh, the son of this guy, and in the sight of Hanamel, my uncle's son, and in the sight of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase before all the Jews who were sitting in the court of the garden. You're saying, well, what is this all about? And I commanded Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, this sealed deed of purchase, and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but the scrolls, a lot of the scrolls, um, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were in earthen jars, you know, with little caps on them. And they survived a couple of thousand years before they were broken open and there they were, uh, preserved. That they may last a long time. <laughs> and, uh, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will again be bought in this land. So this was an exercise to remind not only Jeremiah, but of course those in there, is that, yes, God's removing you from the land, but you'll get to come back in. And of course, we know after 70 years, they were actually allowed to come back. And, and uh, so the idea of this would be, hey, this needs to last for 70 years, bury it somewhere. But when I come back, I'm going to dig this up and say, listen, this is my land. I have a deed to this land. And God's saying, listen, when you come back, you are gonna, there's going to be a chance for the Jewish people to buy land again. They don't own the country. It's not theirs anymore. It's going to be in the hands of another world ruling power for all, all the way through the time of Jesus, but they are going to be able to uh, possess some land. So, uh, amazing uh, um, sign. And uh, now, verse 16, after I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Nerai, then I prayed to the Lord saying, ah, oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you who shows loving kindness to thousands but repays the iniquity of fathers uh, into the bosom of their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name, great in counsel and mighty in deed, 
um, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, giving to everyone according to his, uh, to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. And who has, who has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, he's thinking back, and even to this day, both in Israel and among mankind, and you have made a name for yourself as at this day. So he was, he was being thankful for this, and he was saying, Lord, this seems impossible that we'll ever gonna get a chance to come back here, but you're great and you're mighty and you can do this thing. He says, you brought your people Israel, verse 21, out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders and with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terror. That was terror toward Egypt. And gave them this land. And that's kind of part of the key of it. You gave them, you gave us this land, which you swore to their fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. They came and they took possession of it, but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They have done nothing of all that you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have made all this calamity come upon them. He's lamenting the fact that this is a promised land that, that had an eternal promise that was with it and now we're losing it. And it's gone. It's gone from history as far as he was concerned. You know, you, you look at it and on the landscape of history, that was just crossed off. This nation that once was and now is carried away and going to be, you know, gone there. And he says, behold, the siege ramps have reached the city to take it. And the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans who fight against it because of the sword the famine and the pestilence and what you have spoken has come to pass and behold, you see it. You have said to me, O Lord, buy for yourself the field with money and call in witnesses. Although the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. So he's saying, but I don't, I don't get this. Why am I doing this? Why did you ask me to do this? Uh, this land is gone it's uh, already in the hands of somebody else. Yes, somewhere way deep down in the future, you know, uh, this possibility that, that uh, obviously we could come back. Um, then the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. It's good to have the Lord break it up every once in a while. <laughs> Gets tired of you rambling on. Uh, hey, can I get a word in edgewise? He says, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm about to give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and, and he will take it. The Chaldeans who are fighting against the city will enter, and they'll set this city on fire and they'll burn it. With the houses where the people have offered incense to Baal on their roofs and poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. What have they done with this land? They've defiled my name. Their homes, their possessions, they, it will burn. Indeed, the sons of Israel and the sons of Judah have been doing only evil in my sight from their youth. For the sons of Israel have been only provoking me to anger by the work of their hands, declares the Lord. Verse 31. Indeed, this city has been to me a provocation of my anger and my wrath from the day that they built it, even to this day. So that it should be removed from before my face. Because all of the evil of the sons of Israel and the sons of Judah, um, which they have done to provoke me to anger. Uh, they, their kings, their leaders, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. None of them have been faithful to me. They have turned their back to me and not their face. Should have been turning their face toward God, right? Though, though I taught them teaching again and again, they would not listen and receive instruction. But they, they put their detestable things in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. Again, we know this has been repeated over and over. Uh, the Lord, again, is recalling what has been done uh, to him. They built the high places of Baal that are in the valley of Ben-Hinnon uh, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire of Molech. I mean, they've actually burned their own children in the arms of a fake god or a 
you know, an abomination, basically, um, which I had not commanded them, nor had entered my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. How wicked can you become? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning this city, of which you say it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all the lands to which I have driven them in my anger, in my wrath, and in great indignation, and I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. You can see it the way it is now. And it's an abomination. Yes, they will go out. But one day I will bring them back in. And this will be a different, a different place. And they will be able to dwell safely. He's not just speaking about the return in 70 uh, years uh, there. Because that really didn't happen for them. But he's speaking about, again, the second return of the Lord. Uh, which is on the horizon of our day. They shall be my people and I will be their God and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. Think about the promises. Think about the covenants. Think about all God said they, he desired them to be for the entire earth to know him. And that has all failed. Miserable failure. In fact, they're an abomination to the nations around them. But that's going to change. And it's amazing to me to think of Israel today because they still haven't come to their Savior, to Jesus. But the picture of what they will look like when they do and they make Jesus their Lord and Savior and, uh, and they become a light to this entire earth. It's not going to happen in the tribulation. Their hearts will be turning. Their lives will be turning and all of it. But by the end of the uh, tribulation, there will be a, this nation here purged completely. And as Paul says, all of them will have turned their hearts to the Lord. <clears throat> and the Lord will come back and he'll establish this new covenant that we talked about here. And uh, they will be this uh, thing that the Lord has desired them to be. Verse 40, I will make an everlasting covenant with them that... I will not turn away from uh, them and do them, um, uh, excuse me, and I will not turn away from them to do them good, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will uh, not turn away from me. I will rejoice over them to do them good and will faithfully plant them in this land and all my heart um, and with, uh, excuse me, and with all my heart and with all my soul. So you see the pleading of the Lord. This, this um, is very important to the Lord, isn't it? And with all of his heart and with all of his soul, he will delight in bringing them back in and restoring them, uh, even though it's breaking his heart to send them out and to their destruction. Verse 42, for thus says the Lord, just as I brought all this great disaster on this people, so I am going to bring them all the good that I am promising them. You're thinking of all the bad right now, Jeremiah, but I'm thinking already ahead of all the good that's going to come from this. Fields will be bought in this land of which you say it is a desolation without man or beast. It is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men will buy fields for money. Uh, sign and seal deeds. Now we're getting back to the whole purpose of this picture, and call and witness in the land of Benjamin, in the environs of Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the lowland, in the cities of the Negev, and for I will restore their fortunes, declares uh, the Lord. So, why is he doing this? Because this is a picture of what the Lord is going to do on their behalf. There's a term a Hebrew term called the Goel. The Goel, it's kind of like the kinsman redeemer, if you know that from the story of Ruth. And, um, and we'll see this a little bit later. Um, 
there was a promise that God had there when he put them into the land that they were um, given chances to redeem their land if it fell out of their hands. Could be for debts that were owed uh, for a lot of different reasons and um, as we'll see here, but every seven sevens, um, every 49 years, no matter what has happened, there would be a balancing of the scales uh, for the opportunity of that land to go back to the people who possessed it. And this is kind of a picture of a promise that means that this, this land can still be redeemed. It's still redeemable, right? And uh, you could redeem your land, and, but if you were not able to purchase it back, which Israel isn't going to be able to do, uh, you would have the opportunity to go to the next kinsman, the next person of the family, somebody else more distant in the family as you work your way out, and they would have an opportunity to redeem it. And that's what happened with, with Boaz. Um, he had a chance to redeem the property of Naomi there. But in doing that, uh, he was the second in line. So the first guy had to, you know, said, listen, I, I don't, I don't want to do it. Because with the land came Ruth. And I've, I've already got a wife and I, I don't want to get into all of that. And uh, Boaz says, I'll redeem it. And uh, of course, part of that was to, um, because Naomi's son, his oldest son, had not produced another son. And his wife was without son. And so now this kinsman needed to bring that family, uh, that redemption to produce a son in them so that that family um, uh, would uh, continue, that family line would continue. So um, Boaz, again, was willing to do that. And um, in the same way, this is interesting, <clears throat> because the Bible also says that the earth was given just like the land of Israel. That's why it's not by chance that God spends all of this time regarding one little piece of land and this promised land all the way through because it has to do with a bigger purchase, which was the entire earth. And Adam was told that this was given to man. Be fruitful and multiply and take dominion over this earth. And, and it was for man to do that. Um, but it was lost, wasn't it? Because Adam succumbed to sin and he fell from that. And uh, from the fall of Adam, uh, we, we see that Satan entered in to corrupt the lands or to take authority or dominion. There's, the Bible says there's there's powers and authorities and rulers in the air, and right, and Satan's a part of that. And, and Satan himself has um, control or had control in, in some ways over that. He says that to Jesus when Jesus is in the wilderness. And remember, he comes to Jesus and he's uh, in a temptation. And Satan, it says here, led him, Jesus, up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Uh, so he thought. And uh, therefore, if you worship me, it shall be yours. I'll give you the kingdoms. I'll give you the deed to them. Um, and then you'll have the deed, and I'll give it to you. And Jesus answered him, uh, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So what's the point? Jesus came to this earth as the second Adam, didn't he? And he lived a sinless life and he died for the sin of all mankind, didn't he? The sin of the world, he atoned for the sins of the world. So what did Jesus do? He made a payment, didn't he? He redeemed mankind, and in that he conquered the, uh, the curse of sin, right? And he broke that. He not only brought redemption to anyone who would come to him, he became the Goel of the earth, didn't he? And, and uh, the Bible says that the earth 
Um, now the Lord owns the rights to the earth because he's paid for them. And he can offer them and do with them as he pleases. You say, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, in the book of Revelation, is an interesting story. Chapter 5 in the book of Revelation, John's caught up to heaven and he's, he's there in heaven and it's glorious. And, and in chapter 5, though, he looks over to the Lord God on his throne and in his right hand is a book or is a, a, a scroll and it has seven seals on it. And that becomes the attention and an angel declares and he says, who is worthy to open the scroll? And they looked around and the Bible says, and he says, I saw between the thrones four living creatures and the elders and the lambs standing as if slain, having seven horns and, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And um, um, it says, uh, oh, the angel told him, stop weeping. He said, behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. It says, and he came, Jesus came, and he took the book out of the right hand of the Father who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You say, well, why was John so weepy over all of this? It says, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests uh, to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. That was because Jesus had paid for that, and now he was able to, right, take that scroll, as he said, that was to be buried there, to undo uh, that and to say, listen, I'm the one who has the deed uh, to all of this. It's a great picture. And with that, we see that Israel will be another example of that. The earth does not want to give Israel back uh, their place, and they'll do everything they can to make sure they don't get it. Um, but Jesus says, it's mine to give, and I'm going to give it back. And in the establishment of Jesus on his throne, in his kingdom, coming toward us, you could say, well, my church doesn't believe that. I, I get it. But I'm just telling you, this is what Jeremiah is teaching. This is what Ezekiel is teaching. This is what Dan Daniel is teaching. This is what Isaiah is teaching. And all of the prophets that Jesus has promised this nation that he is going to redeem that land. And he is going to give it back. And that's what he's saying here in this. He's promising them that uh, I can and I will. Um, and I'm able to bring this redemption here uh, to you. Genesis 17, eight, uh, 7 and 8, he said to Abraham, he says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and between your descendants after you and throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and uh, to your descendants after you. Now that looks like this is completely broken at this time. Because God saying, no, no, I'm driving you out now. But he says, I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. It's an amazing scripture. And he says, and I will be their God. So that is still reigning true even uh, at this time. It's a great picture, amazing thing of the redemption of the Lord. Um, but in the sense of this earth and the coming days of this earth, the Lord's going to fulfill it. Chapter 33. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time. This is actually um, a little later on. This is actually a, a year back from this. But it says, And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time when he was still um, confirmed. Oh, I'm sorry. This is still at the same time. Uh, same time frame. He's still in the court of the guard saying, Thus says the Lord who made the earth... The Lord who formed it and to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. For thus says the Lord God 
of Israel concerning the houses of this city and uh, concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are broken down uh, to make a defense against the siege ramps uh, and against the sword. So they basically tore all their houses apart to try to build as much armory and different things they could to withstand the, uh, um, the uh, Babylonian or the Chaldean army. While they are coming to fight with the Chaldeans to fill them with the corpses of men whom I have slain in my anger and in my wrath, and I have hidden my face from this city because of all their wickedness. Basically, they're trying to put their last stand up, but it's going to be their coffin. They're going to be buried in it, right? Behold, I will bring it to health and healing, and I will heal them, and I will reveal to them an abundance of peace and truth. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel, and I will rebuild them as they were at first. All you can see is this image. I mean, just chaos and famine and pestilence and, I mean, death is what this whole city looks like as you look across it. I mean, it's it's hideous to look at. And the Lord is still calling Jeremiah to say, but that's the way it's going to always be. And so I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their uh, iniquities by which they have sinned against me and by which they have transgressed against me. It will be to me a name of joy, praise, and glory before all the nations of the earth, which will hear of all the good that I do for them. As I've said before, when you think of Israel, you just think of God casting them out. I mean, that's all we know in history for the last 2,500 years. Um, Their name, you know, was a resounding thing of their unfaithfulness to the God of the Bible. That's why they were in all of these nations all over the earth. So, you know, obviously Satan has used that for them to be persecuted everywhere that they went. And because their name stood for it and God is saying, listen, but I have a a different um, thing in my mind and in my heart because I know this is going to eventually be their name will be a name of joy because they're going to stand for in the millennial kingdom Israel will be the shining light because when all the nations of the earth raged against God and were defiant and wicked against him there was one people who were the shining light and they will be Again, shown that way throughout that thousand year reign of Christ. And there'll be a name, Israel, of joy, praise and glory before all the nations of of the earth. And of course, the Lord's name will be great for restoring them. And they will fear and tremble because all of the good and all of the peace that I make for it. Thus says the Lord, yet again, there will be heard in this place of which you say it is a waste, without man, without beast. That is, in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate now, without man, without inhabitant, and without beast, they will be the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of uh, the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who say, give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And of those who bring a thank offering into the house of the Lord, for I will Restore the fortunes of the land as uh, they were at first, says the Lord. The Lord is willing to discipline them, to put this nation through this whole horrific thing, knowing that out in the future, one day, that relationship is going to be restored. They're going to repent. They're going to relent. They're going to turn back to the Lord. And then their city will now reflect what it was intended to reflect God had this beautiful plan when he brought them into the land. And, of course, it never unfolded, did it? But it will. Verse 12, thus says the Lord of hosts, there will again be in this place which is waste without a man or beast and in all of its cities a habitation of shepherds who rest in their flocks. So here's Jeremiah in the dungeon and he's thinking of all that's coming and the Lord's filling his mind now with some wonderful pictures of what will be um, in the cities of all of the hills of, um, of the hill country, in the cities of the lowland, in the cities of the Negev, in the, the land of Benjamin, in the environs of Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, the flocks will again pass under the hands of the one who numbers them, 
says the Lord, and the shepherds will return. Verse 14, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth. And again, this is going to be the hand of the Lord. He shall execute justice and righteousness on earth. And speaking of the Lord, his son who will be uh, the king over Israel. And those in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. It's pretty cool. That's what they'll be known for. The Lord is our righteousness. I think of Israel. They say, man, that's the Lord. Uh, the Lord is our righteousness. That's, that's who those people are. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel Um, obviously he'll be king forever. And the Levitical priests, this is interesting, shall never lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings and to prepare sacrifices continually. That's pretty interesting because there are, um, uh, even in uh, Ezekiel, it says the same thing. It says when the Lord comes back and he's ruling and reigning in Jerusalem and the temple's restored, so will be the priesthood. I don't know if there'll be all the Levites, but uh, Israel will be a part of this as well. And the, um, it says the Levitical priests shall never lack a man, so I guess it will be the Levites will be restored just as it was promised. And they'll be offering offerings. Now, that doesn't seem right. Because the Lord is, He was the offering. He's the Lamb. But if you read closely, you'll see that um, they're going to offer burnt offerings, burnt grain offerings, and prepare sacrifices continually. Why will there be any of those offerings made in the millennium? Uh, Why would they be uh, required? Um, Again, the burnt offerings don't represent the Passover lamb or the uh, the, uh, blood offering that was offered for sin. This was the burnt offering of consecration. So when I think of Israel going uh, to um, uh, one of the feasts, right? And um, when they go before the Lord, I think of all of the lambs that are slain and uh, the cows as well that are there. And one of the things the Lord designed is he said, listen, let me show you how to carve them up. And they would carve them up, and there were certain parts, choice parts, that they were to offer to the Lord. And uh, on this barbecue, basically. And then there were other parts that were given to the priests for their uh, eating. And then there were uh, other parts of this offering that were given to each person that brought that sacrifice. And what would they do with them? They would have, they would able to barbecue them. And uh, to be able to share them with their families. So when you went to the feasts, if you went into the city there of Jerusalem, um, you would smell what we like to smell when we go by a good barbecue joint, right? It's that beautiful fragrance of of barbecue. And I don't know about you, but when you think of barbecue, you think of um, a celebration and uh, people gathering together. And that's what those feasts were relationship with the Lord, fellowship, but also fellowship uh, with their families. And so uh, there's going to be a lot of barbecue during the millennium, and uh, there'll be for fellowship. In fact, people will bring in, they'll bring offerings to the Lord from the Gentile uh, peoples as well. There'll be fellowship with the Lord, there'll be offerings there, and uh, that'll be a celebration. Uh, they'll, they'll continue on until the eternal uh, state but this is a picture before all the Lord, I mean, before all the world. And if you're out there in one of those nations there, you're, you're going to have the opportunity to come and to be with the Lord and to fellowship with the Lord. And the same thing, to bring your offerings to the Lord, and it'll be beautiful and wonderful. A lot of those smelled really great as well, um, these, uh, the grain offerings and uh, the different offerings that were there. Verse 19. So the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, which is uh, the sun and the moon, 
so that day and night will not be at their appointed time. Then my covenant may also be broken with David, the, my servant, that he will not have a son to reign on this throne with the Levitical priests, my ministers. Now, we've heard this before, but that had to do with his covenant to bring them back into the land and to be their God. But now he uses the same covenant, the same way of saying, you know, when you don't see the sun anymore, you don't see the moon anymore, uh, then you could think that I'm going to fail to fulfill my covenant, which is to fill that, th- uh, that uh, throne um, with a descendant of David, and then also to restore the Levitical priests, my ministers. God says, it's going to be the way it was designed to be. And um, you can count on it. And this is interesting because he says, just, just as the rest of the promises will be fulfilled, there's going to be Le- the Levitical priesthood uh, around me on my thing. They're serving there and offering these sacrifices. Have you not observed, verse 24, that uh, what this people have spoken, saying, two families, speaking of Israel and Judah, uh, which the Lord chose... He has rejected them. Thus they despise my people. No longer uh, they as a nation uh, are they a nation in, uh, in their sight. Thus says the Lord, if my covenant for day and night stand not and the fixed patterns of the heavens and the earth, uh, then I have, uh, uh, um, and earth I have not established, then I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, not taking from his descendants rulers over the descendants of Abraham, <coughs> excuse me, Isaac and Jacob, but I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. I'm going to say it again, just because it kind of bubbles up inside of me when I read through all of this. I, I would be very careful if I were going to take a position to say that's not going to happen. Israel is not going to come back and be restored. And again, many, 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 many people have said, listen, I, that isn't going to happen. God's replaced them with the church. I don't think that's a good thing to, to hang your hat on. Why? Because I saw the sun. Even if it was cloudy, I know the sun's there and the moon and all of it. And I'm pretty sure God is going to fulfill to detail all the things that he's promised. Now, you're, it's raining pretty good, huh? You're here today. What do you believe? You're reading this along with me. Do you believe this is going to happen? I mean, Jeremiah, he's in prison right now, and he's seeing everything fall down but beside him in the most powerful army <clears throat> the earth has ever known, taking over this land. Are we ever going to see it again? God says, it's going to happen. I promise you it will happen. Do we believe it will happen? Does it sound like he's going to do this for Israel? Uh, Yes. Does it sound like some kind of spiritual description that's going to go on in the earth or or in heaven and not on the earth? No, it doesn't. So um, that's why you look at that and you say, how could you read through all of this and still hold that position? It makes no sense. There's I, I can't even comprehend how you could say, oh, that's, none of that's going to happen. You know, that's all. You know, the book of Revelation, nah, it's not going to happen. It's already, already been in the past. No tribulation, no, um, I have a tough time uh, with that. Psalm 72, 10 and 11 says, Let the kings of Tarshish and the islands uh, bring presents, the kings of Sheba and Sheba offer gifts, and let all kings bow down before him. All nations serve him. So it's a little picture of what's going to happen in the millennium. Chapter 34. The word, uh, this prophecy again was a couple of years before this. So this goes backwards at least a year. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from, from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all of his army with all the kingdoms of the earth that were under his dominion and all the peoples were fighting against Jerusalem and against all of its cities. Again, this is a little bit earlier, so they hadn't quite finished the siege ramps and all of this. This is a little ways back in Zedekiah's 
uh, life here. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and say to him, thus says the Lord, behold, I'm giving the city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and uh, he will burn it with fire. Again, this was the first time um, <clears throat> he heard this from Jeremiah, and Jer- this, this is where Jeremiah probably got put into prison. He's been there quite a while. Uh, it says, you will not escape from his hand, for you will surely be captured and delivered into his hand, and you will see the king of Babylon eye to eye, and he will speak with you face to face, and you will go to Babylon. Verse 4, yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of uh, Judah. Thus says the Lord concerning you, you will not die by the sword. That's nice to hear. You will, you will die in peace. Uh, I, I, I would choose that, wouldn't you? I wouldn't mind dying in peace. And as spices are burned for the fathers, the former kings who were before you, so they will burn spices for you, and they will lament you. Not from here, huh, but from Babylon. Right? Alas, Lord, for I have spoken the word, declares the Lord. Um, then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah the king of Judah in Jerusalem. When the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and against all the remaining cities of Judah. So they, they hadn't quite taken all of the cities yet, but they were already battling right outside the city. So they were right there. The army was right outside. That is Lachish, Azekah, for they alone remained as fortified cities among the cities of Judah. So now, this covenant, interesting. Verse 8, <clears throat> the word uh, which came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah. So picture this. Somewhere along there, King Zedekiah kind of got, I, I, better, I better think about flying right and doing what's right here. He, he wasn't quite believing he was, that the city was going to go down. But he made a covenant with all the people, that is all the people that are remain, who were in Jerusalem to proclaim uh, uh, release to them that each man should set free his male servant and each man his female servant, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, anybody that's, uh, again, part of their nation, so that no one should keep them, uh, a, a Jew his brother, in bondage. And you say, wow, they had slavery? Uh, yeah, they did. It's called servitude. So if you owed money uh, and you, whatever, you stole something or whatever it is, you you had to go pay that off, and so you would go into servitude for whoever uh, you, know, you had to pay that debt off to. And, uh, and all the officials and all the people obeyed who had entered into the covenant that each man should set free his male servant and each man his female servant so that no one should keep them any longer in bondage. And they obeyed and they set them free. Basically, <laughs> if this is true, we're all going to be slaves. So at this point, we've got to drop all this. We're all brothers. So I'm telling you, I'm making a covenant. And the covenant was you took an animal, uh, a, sh- a sheep, uh, a, a lamb, whatever it is. You split the lamb down the middle and just filleted it open. And then the covenant was that you walked through that middle of that um, slaughtered animal there. And that covenant was that the, the, we'll see that the princes and all of them afterwards made the same covenant. These leaders and all these people made this covenant. <clears throat> so <clears throat> they um, had made uh, this and they, and they all obeyed it and they set their, uh, uh, basically their slaves free. But afterwards they turned around, verse 11, and they took back the male servants and the female servants. I mean, isn't it amazing how greedy you could be? You're at the end of your life. I mean, this is the end of the end. And you're like, but I'm still going to keep my you know, slave. So they had power to do that, right? So whom they had set free. And they brought them into subjection for male servants and for female servants. So obviously this has been a whole year that they've taken the servants back and they brought them back in, even though... The, the, the armies were at the, at the gates. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt or out of their slavery, right? From the house of bondage saying, At the end of seven years, each of you shall set free his Hebrew brother who has been sold to you and has served you six years you shall send him. In other words, you couldn't owe anything more than you could pay it for six, 
in six years. You have to send him out free from you, but your forefathers did not obey me or incline their ear to me. They haven't obeyed this. They just kept them because they had power over them. They had they never obeyed this rule of the Lord, the covenant that they made with the Lord. Although recently you had turned and done what is right in my sight, each man proclaimed release to his neighbor, and you had made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Yet you turned and you profaned my name, and each man took back his male servant and each man his female servant, from whom you had set free uh, to their, um, according to their desire, and you brought them into subjection to be your male servants and female servants. Therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me in the proclaiming release uh, to release each man and his brother and each man to his neighbor. Behold, I am proclaiming a release to you. I'm going to release you now, declares the Lord, to the sword. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do for you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to make you I'm going to hold you to your covenant. And uh and and um and that means just like that thing was slaughtered, if you break that covenant, then let me be slaughtered. And the Lord says, I'm going to hold you to your covenant. So all of you did this, I'm going to make sure you die by the sword and uh you will fulfill your you will you broke your covenant and now you'll pay uh the price uh for it. And, uh, and that goes on in verse 18 to cutting the lamb in half. And uh, verse 19, the officials of Judah and the officials of Jerusalem, the court officers and the priests, and all the people of the land who pass between the parts of the calf, I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. And their dead bodies will be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the air. Basically, their bodies will be split open and... Uh, in fulfillment of this uh, covenant. You say, wow, that's pretty graphic, isn't it? Verse 22, behold, I am going to command, declares the Lord, and I will bring them back to this city, and they will fight against it and take it and burn it with fire, and I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitants. So uh, the armies are still working on this siege, and he says, listen, I'm going to bring them back around full force, and they're going to take this city, and uh, you will be uh, finished. I'd like to just read this last uh, chapter, if I can. Just bear with me another few minutes. The word, <clears throat> this prophecy goes even farther back to King Jehoiakim. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go to the house of the Rechabites. This is really fascinating to me, anyway. The house of the Rechabites. Don't know who they are. And speak to them and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. So then I took Jehazadana, whatever it is, the son of Jeremiah, the son of this guy and his brothers and all of his sons in the whole house of the Rechabites. They went and found him. They got him. And they brought him into the house of the Lord into the chamber of the sons of Hannah, the son of that guy, the man of God, which was near the chamber of the officials, which was above the chamber of this guy and the son of Shalom, the doorkeeper. Basically, they brought him in in front of all of the leaders of the city, all the officials, all the leaders, all of them. They brought this group of people there, the Rechabites. And then they set before the men of the house of the Rechabites full pitchers of wine and cups, and they said to them, drink wine. That must have been a luxury, even back in this time, because they were still suffering in Jehoiakim's time. It says, but they said, we will not drink wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which they're the Rechabites, our father, was a descendant father, commanded us, saying, you shall not drink wine, nor your sons, forever. You shall not build a house, and you shall not sow seed and you shall not plant a vineyard, our own one. But in tents you shall dwell all your days, that you may live many days in the land where you uh, sojourn. Basically, you're strangers in this land. They weren't Jews. They were another group that had come in. And uh, they didn't build houses. They didn't, you know, till the land. They didn't own the land. They just had, you know, animals there and uh, herds. And it says, we have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he commanded us, not to drink wine all of our days, 
we, our wives, our sons, or our daughters, nor to build ourselves houses to dwell in, and we do not have vineyard or field or seed. We have only dwelt in tents and have obeyed and have done according to all that Jonadab, our father, had commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against the land, we said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem before the army of the Chaldeans and before the army of the uh, Arameans. So we have dwelt in Jerusalem. That's the only reason they came into the city. It was just because war and all of that and they had come into the city. They were Bedouins. And if you go to Jerusalem today, you'll see going up there, uh, there's all this herds and all of that and tents and these people living in the tents. They're Bedouins and They've lived in there for generation after generation after generation. And this group was the same. They were like Bedouins. And uh, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all these leaders, He says, Will you not receive instruction by listening to my words, declares the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which he commanded his sons not to drink wine or are observed. So they do not drink wine to this day, for they have obeyed their father's command. But I, I have spoken to you again and again, yet you have not listened to me. Here's these Bedouins living out here, and they're doing all of this because one of their forefathers says, you shall never you know, build a house. You shall never do the land. You shall never drink wine. And generations have gone by and they're obeying it because of one of their forefathers. And yet God's saying, listen, I've commanded you all these things and you don't obey any of my commands. And uh, they have been faithful and you have not. Also, I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, and uh, you have not listened uh, to me. Yet also I've sent you my servants, uh, excuse me, sending them again and again, saying, turn now every man from his evil way, attend your deeds, and do not go after other gods to worship them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given you and your fathers, but you have not inclined your ear to listen to me. Now these guys didn't do it from a supernatural move of God. They just did it out of honor to a four person back in their history they're willing to keep all of these things and God says I'm the living God who did all of this and you would not uh, uh, do the same for me indeed the sons of Jonadab the son of Rechab have observed the command of their father which he commanded them but this people has not listened to me Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing on Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the disaster that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken to them, but they did not listen. And I have called them, but they did not answer. What a good object lesson that was for all these guys. Finally, uh, verse 18, Then Jeremiah said to the house of the Rechabites, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Because you have obeyed the command of Jonadab, your father, kept all his commands and done according to all that he commanded you. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not lack a man to stand before me always. Your generation, your people will never pass away. It's pretty amazing. God's a covenant God and uh, he wants Israel to be faithful to that covenant, but they're not faithful to that covenant. And we can look at Israel and we can say, well, I would have been faithful. Be careful. Because they're a picture of mankind in general, right? And sin is a reminder of that. We broke the covenant of God in sin. And, uh, but Jesus came, what did he do? As a redeemer. And he took the punishment of breaking the covenant, laid his body out for us. He died for us to take that. Galatians Three says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, which means salvation being grafted into salvation. Let me pray for us. Lord, love you tonight. <clears throat> You're faithful. Man has not been faithful to you. We are not faithful to you in our flesh, Lord, or in, our, um, uh, in, our, in the darkness of our hearts, Lord. But you were faithful to us and you were willing to 
bear the curse for us <clears throat> and, Lord, then turn around and redeem us. We're so thankful for that. We had no hope, Lord, no hope to ever open that deed, Lord, to life. But, Lord, you had purchased that for us. And, and you also have the authority to do whatever you want on this earth, Lord. And, and as we look at your faithfulness to Israel, we're amazed, Lord, that through everything, Lord, uh, you were going to redeem them and bring them back in. And what a great picture that is of your faithfulness, your love, and your, your goodness to us. Give you praise and we give you thanks in Jesus' name.